Welcome to We Got Balls, real, raw, masculine sex talk with Chris Inman and Scott Cohn. Chris and Scott both work with men who want to leave their unwanted sexual struggles in the past. They are willing to do whatever it takes to help men get curious about what drives their compulsive sexual behavior. With that said, here we go. Hey guys, welcome back to We Got Balls. We've got an exciting and very realistic episode for you today. We want to dive into the world of reality porn. What does it mean to be watching videos that depict real life situations and feel very true to what's going on in our lives? We were struck by one uh, recent technological innovation put out by Apple, which is the Vision Pro Goggles. And of course, there's other products that have been put out by Oculus and Meta and all these different places as well. But I saw a number of headlines, and I'm just going to read one of these headlines to you, Scott, and get your reaction. It says, why Apple's Vision Pro will turn men into sexless porn addicts. What's your take on that? Well, um, it's an interesting headline because... When I think about guys wearing Apple Pro and using it to kind of get in, immersed into, you know, a, a first person perspective user experience, they're going to be having sex. It'll just be with themselves. So, oh, <laughs> yeah. so virtual sex, I guess, is what you're saying. It'll be yeah. either, you know, they'll be masturbating or they'll put something on their penis and, and it will seem like it's a sexual experience with maybe a real person on another uh continent something like that but but it's going to be um it'll be sexual it just won't be in person sexual so yeah well if you want a comedic take on this you can check out the first episode of the Pete Davidson series Bubkiss where in the very first episode he's got his goggles on and he's tuned into some VR porn some POV porn and he starts looking for the lotion and wandering around his house with his penis out and his mom's come mom comes downstairs and gives him his laundry and he comes all over the laundry when she walks through the door nice <laughs> i mean that's that's a great comedic and and no triggers in that when there's nothing shown that would be uh salacious but it is very comedic in this idea of you know when we're looking for reality there's all kinds of forms of reality whether that's somebody that's personally in our space uh, another uh, in this article, it goes on to say things like um, you've probably heard of AI girlfriends, which are their their al algorithmic other halves, which can be whatever you want. Perfect companies, whoever they are age wise, and they're willing to meet your emotional needs. And I think that's when we talk about reality. That's what we're looking for is we're trying to personalize and customize our experiences to the things that resonate with us in our real lives. And so that's that's re really where we want to go today is what kind of porn uh, is going on uh, in your mind that you want to create for yourself to make it real and connective and intimate in your dynamic. And what are the things that are going on behind that that are harmful or broken or, uh, or, or traumatic even that could be shaping those desires for you sexually? Yeah, so let's... Um... Let, let's just kind of set the stage here for this discussion today, because this category of reality, you could also call it amateur. You could also sure. call it homemade. Um, it's pretty broad. Like it could encompass. What about sexting? That's reality. If I send a picture yeah, of yeah, my yeah. penis to somebody and they send a picture of their vagina or their penis to me, that's yeah. a real life situation. What about camming? That's reality. What about OnlyFans? Because it seems like there's a real connection there with a real person. So that mm. it's a pretty broad category. And frankly, we're going to do episodes on OnlyFans. We're going to do an episode on uh, sexting because it's extremely prevalent and there's some real um, dangerous actually situations going on in sexting. For example, sextortion is really I sent uh, you this article yesterday about a new app that's out there that's really hooking a lot of younger folks. And and it's it's uh, there's a sexting scam going on where you send a picture of your body, your penis, whatever to them. And then they turn around and extort money from you. And there are kids that actually have committed mm -hmm. suicide over this in the last six months. So it's, yes. it's extremely yes. sad. It's extremely uh, dangerous for for younger people in particular. 
to get involved in these things. And we want to provide that kind of helpful information. But it, the point is, this category is pretty broad. So today we're going to limit the discussion to just pornography and, and in particular video pornography that is mm -hmm. portraying what seems to be realistic sexual scenarios by real people. Okay. So mm -hmm. this category, here's, here's just the fascinating data on this. Again, referring to our Pornhub year in review annual yep. report. Um, yep. our, and, our encyclopedia of porn that we come back to over and over again. Uh, amateur is the 11th most viewed category in the mm -hmm. world. So on Pornhub, the number one uh, tube video site for pornography in the world, this is the 11th most viewed category. Um, it was the, um, or it's the, it's in the, it, it is uh, amateur porn is the 11th most viewed category in 2022. Yep. However, it was the top gaining category for the year. So it experienced the greatest growth over all the categories on Pornhub. So Scott, in, in internet language, it's trending. It's trending. trending big time. Trendy, very trendy. And, um, and, and the categories, as we said, that you can also see as they, as they dive down into the most searched terms, for example, in the US, it's in the top 20 under the category of real amateur homemade. So that's the United States um, figures there. So this is a very popular category. So what's going on there? Well, I think what's going on there is what you referred to in the opener, which was there is this quest for authenticity yes. in the world today. Yes. And uh, one of the biggest problems we have right now is deep fake. Everything's made up. Everything is AI confabulated, and we don't know what's real anymore. Mm. And so in the midst of all this uncertainty about, is that news item real? Is that picture of that celebrity naked real? Is this real? What, you know? Um, and, and the deep fake is so good now, you could take our pictures from our faces and put them out there and do a deep fake of us doing whatever you want. Yeah, um, you could so, do a fake podcast based on the podcast we've already done. Just take fact, the video, rip it up, and just have fake Chris and Scott and talk about whatever. You know, I like that idea, actually. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are. But I think I think it's important to say this, especially on this topic, is there is no way that a computer, no matter how good it gets, and I'll just say this as prophetically as I can, can ever approximate what it feels like what it smells like, what it touch, what the touch is like to be with a real human being. There is no artificial intelligence that can Im imitate that. And when we're talking about reality porn, I think that's really at the heart of what we're looking for. I'll go back to the very, that very first story that I read on our very first episode um, of this podcast. And what I found in my searches very shortly was some scenarios of, People in real life situations, of course, they were porn actors, but they were playing it as amateur actors um, in real life scenarios that that were clumsy, that were awkward. There wasn't really great. You know, the dialogue's never good, but it was about this visceral human connection. They get naked together. They touch one another. They make out together. They please one another. They orgasm uh, for and with one another. And, and it's that human experience that I think we're all chasing when we think about traditional video porn. And really, if you even move into AI and other expressions of that, we're looking for the humanity, the sensuality in that. And for me, that's been my one of my arousal templates all throughout my porn struggle was looking at people who looked like they loved one another and wanted to be together and that was the draw. I want to see the eyes. I want to see, I, I loved looking for porn starlets who had, they were, they were acting. Okay. This is not where they were. Cause we, I've heard stories from them after they left the business, but they looked genuinely excited about whatever was going on. They were eager to be with. So yeah, that brings up this really interesting thought 
And that is that so much of what drives human connection is shown in our faces, right? Yes, yes. And so, um, which is why, you know, the uh, bukkake where the guy ejaculates in the girl's face or a group of guys does it is a really popular porn genre because you're seeing the woman's face as the yep. guy is experiencing his orgasms. Yeah. So stay tuned for the objectification episode of the, of the, uh, we got balls podcast. <laughs> but, but I think what's happened here is there's yeah. this really interesting progression that's occurred in the culture with pornography over the years. So, you know, if you go back to the seventies, um, the, the most available form of porn for most guys growing up would be penthouse or playboy magazine yeah, yeah. maybe hustler you could if you were risky enough you could go down to a dirty newsstand in your town and buy you know really graphic magazines but sure but it was fairly limited in the number of pictures that were in there so the content's limited you're paying for it you know it's it's it, there there are all these barriers to entry mm. with the advent of high-speed internet connection and and internet porn it opens kind of the floodgates to everybody to be a porn purveyor. And mm -hmm. that's what you see happening is, I don't think mm -hmm. it created more sexually uh, broken people. I think it just tapped into the sexual brokenness that we're all yeah, part of, right? For sure. For and sure. so now it's available. So it's, it's available, it's affordable, and it's ubiquitous. I can, I can get it anytime I want to. Um, any mood, anything that I want to see is available. And so there's this explosion now of users who normally would have never been exposed to pornography. Like, like in the seventies, if you wanted to see video porn, you had to go down to a dirty theater. You know, we all knew yeah. X rated theaters were in our towns yeah. yep. and you would go in there if you, if you were bold enough to do it as a teenager and there would be three or four guys masturbating in there. It's just not, you know, oh, okay, this is creepy. <laughs> it is creepy. Or the or the little video booths that they used to have in bigger cities. Or the video booth in, a, in yeah. an adult bookstore and, you yeah. know, yeah. people go there and they're having sex. So so that scares off most people. Most people are not going to get exposed. But now that you have it and when it started to become available on VHS, it starts to make its way in, then cable starts to make its way and now the internet just explodes and it's Everybody's got it on their phone. So the porn industry has a heyday. They make a ton of money off of this. But the porn industry is fueled by actors. Yes. They're people that are portraying people having sex. They're, and they're actually having sex. But let's get behind the scenes for a minute. And everybody knows this by now is those guys that are in pornography have abnormally large penises. They're not selected because they have short penises. Um, they have, you know, ripped, muscly bodies. They're they're the epitome of what somebody sees as an alpha male, for example. The, the female porn actresses the, are, are petite. They're super small because it it, it makes everything look larger, and uh, they they have to continually uh, diet and take pills and do things to create an artificial tightness and even the sex acts themselves are staged. If you were to look at, and I'm not asking anyone to go check this out, but use your memory banks, look at the positions that people get put in for the camera angle of sex during pornography. It is not natural. It is literally like, it's like if you put them up against a wall and squish it apart, that's what it takes to be able to show the penetrative acts or the or the objectifying acts that they go through. Yeah. Uh, so, and one more thing: what's the worst part about a porn set, Scott? Have you heard? Have you heard this before? No. Curious, the though. smell. The smell. Really. Universally, when you talk to people who've gotten out of the industry. And you ask them about the worst experiences that they have. They say, I walk into a house or I walk into a set. Usually it's rented houses that they use, borrowed houses. And they say the, the bodily um, secretions create this kind of musty, yucky smell. All the oils and all the things that they have to use to get in that place. And it says, it is disgusting. Hmm. So you're having sex for hours, hours on end with a, a noxious smell to create something that feels real. 
But I think in this, why we're talking about this is there are segments of the population who they'll, they'll record their own sex acts or there will be scenarios that are, you know, it's just a guy and two people in a room filming it that feel very much like real. It, it could feel, feel like something that happened in my bedroom or my living room. And that the arousal in that is this is accessible for me. The, the fantastical porn sets at the beautiful houses with the big, big dicked men and the large, the busty, tiny women out in the infinity pool in the middle yeah. of Los Angeles during the day. Right. Exactly. And it's not and, real. And all the guys are taking Viagra. Their erections yep. never fade during sex. Right. Um, they always ejaculate and shoot across the room. It's ridiculous. Oh, and it takes them 20 minutes to get there. And it takes them 20 <laughs> minutes to get there. Nobody ever has premature ejaculation. No. Nobody no. has any venereal disease. And I've heard that too, is that, yeah. you know, everybody gets tested in the porn industry, but oftentimes the ladies will have infection, v vaginal infections. And, and yeah. it's not, and these people don't know each other. They'll come on the set and they're actors. So, oh, you're going to have sex with this person today. So let's get to that point because it's acting. And when we have a version, and again, I, I don't want to be naive. There are actors that do reality stuff. But usually it's what I just described. It's two actors that go into a room or go to a bedroom and they have a, a, a camera person that are literally filming them have sex. So it feels more real. But really what we're chasing in this, I, I'm, I'm convinced, is something that's accessible to me. What can I experience with the people in my life or long to experience the people? I mean, really, this is probably the most connective and intimate version of porn that's out there because it can imitate real relational dynamics, potentially. Okay, now here's the question. There's something in physics known as the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty, and it has to do with the position of quantum particles in a science experiment. Wait, hold on. We just went into the physics podcast. I, I'm, I just lost half of what you said. What are you talking about? I'm going to make a relationship here. Like, go with <laughs> okay. me. Da Bring down it back. The, down this <laughs> rabbit trail. So in the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty is you can never know the position of a particle until you measure it. But what they have found out in the experiments is the act of measuring actually changes the behavior of the particle. So I apply that to amateur homemade sex by asking mm. the question, when you put a camera in mm -hmm. front of your sex act and you record yep. it, am I actually seeing real behavior or am I seeing staged behavior? Yes, staged behavior, yes. Even as an amateur. Absolutely. So, and, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you how I know this. Um, I have watched uh, online and other places interviews with people who are porn stars. They do porn and they will draw a line. Many of them very strongly between my porn performance on camera and my personal life. And they're very, very protective of their own humanity in saying, I don't do the things that I do on screen ever in my like my sex life outside of uh of the studio is very vanilla because i want and they've said this verbatim i want the human connection i want to be with my partner i want to feel loved and connected with them and feel nurtured and cared for and have the sensation of desire as a human being and that's impossible to get with a camera in the ring. So I'm going to go back to my point that I think I was trying to make and I totally forgot about, which was so much of this is communicated in the face. Can you yes. actually act out true desire? I don't think you can. Oh, we, we, we have a, there is a rabbit hole discussion here that we're going to have to come back to, but I'll introduce it. I think when we talk about what does it mean again, we talked about it in the in the title of the article, sexless, sexless porn, right? I think when people come to use porn for a substitute for true intimacy and love and nurture and care, they can't fake it completely, but I can't see it completely. So we're both blinded in some way. We both are limited in our ability to connect what we really want. So yes, a, a, a porn star, an actor can 
act like they 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 have desire to the point that I am, uh, am unable to see the the real sadness and I'll just go here for a second these people are having sex for a few thousand dollars at best they're spending a day showing every part of their human body and I love the human body it's beautiful but letting other people use it tell them what to do with it put bodily fluids on it manipulate them use them as a puppet for a few thousand dollars because that's in their mind the best way to make money it's a sex they're being used as sex toys it's completely objectifying Abs right absolutely so in that acting and that portraying desire i i don't as someone who's broken and has struggled in the past i don't have the ability in my own uh emotional damaged intimacy ways to see the full picture of what's going on. I'm just seeing, as I did at 16, 17, 18, I just see a naked woman and I want to use her. And I watch videos and I watch other people use her and I fall into the trap. What we're talking about, Scott, is the very heart of why We Got Balls exists. Because we are all looking for something greater. And, and most of us, I would say, everybody who struggles with compulsive porn use and sexual compulsion, struggles to see the humanity, the beauty, the goodness in other people and to grieve where others are unable to see that in themselves as they're offering themselves up as sex objects. Yeah. So this is why I think it is impossible to act through desire. So yeah. I, I was an actor in college. I was a pretty good actor. That's that was my trajectory is I was going to go be a movie star. But take take Reese Witherspoon, for example. Mm -hmm. yep. she, she has trained so well that in a scene, she can act out surprise, yep. right? Yep. So she can act surprised. Oh, thanks for the flowers. She knows how to move her facial muscles and her eyes and her expressions and her gestures to communicate surprise with her body. Yep. But. If Reese Witherspoon is actually surprised, she cannot suppress a true emotion from showing on her face. Mm. Mm. Nobody can. Why? Mm. Because emotion is communicated subconsciously. Mm. Yeah. We, we, read, we yeah. read the state of one another in the face. Yes. So... There's something in CGI known as the uncanny valley where CGI artists try to emulate the human face with computer graphics. Mm -hmm. and they have not been able to bridge, I don't believe yet, this uncanny valley. And the uncanny valley so much has to do with the gaze of a person, with the yes. structure of the muscles around the eyes. Because when you look at computer generated images, and a great example of this is Polar Express, which probably everybody mm -hmm. has seen. When you look at Tom Hanks or the little boy's eyes, they look like doll eyes. They mm. look lifeless, like a shark mm. eyes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Yikes. But, but you cannot communicate through graphics yet, or AI, true human connection through the eyes. And, you know, in, in the book of Psalms, David says this famous line, he goes, keep me as the apple of your eye. Mm. What, what he was saying to God there is, when I see your face, I want to see that you're delighting in me, God. That's yeah. what it means to be the apple of somebody's eye. Like I look in your eye and I see me in your eye, but that means mm -hmm. I see your delight in me, your affection. Sure. I don't think you can act that out. I don't think you can act that out as an amateur if you're having sex with your wife in front of a camera or if you're masturbating in front of a right. camera. But, I think but Scott, the reality is this. I would love to live in that ideal world, and I try to, but for much of my adult life, I chased an illusion of reality, an illusion of desire, and used it as a substitute for the lack of desire and the lack of intimacy in my own life. Yeah. Why, why, why do people um, do that? I mean, you know, yeah, you, we can talk about these fantastical, over-the-top productions of sexuality, and, and those are interesting, but I think... Ultimately, when it boils down, we're all looking for something that will mirror a, an experience in my day to day. 
And, and reality porn, in my opinion, is the closest thing to that, whether amateur, homemade, um, mutual, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whatever that is that, you know, what are the, what are the key pieces of this reality dynamic that draw people in? Well, I think it goes back to your family system and, yeah. you know, that quote from Kurt Thompson, the Christian, um, psychiatrist that we keep using in the podcast, which is, I came into the world looking for somebody looking for me. Yes. And when I don't find him in my home, mm. I'll go looking outside. And so many of us grew up in homes where there was nobody looking for us. We would mm. look at the face of our mom and dad and they would look away in disgust or they wouldn't look at us or they weren't even there or they looked at us with a harshness and a sternness. And it was just a sense in my body that I don't belong here. I'm not yeah. wanted. I'm not desired. Yeah. And I think the appeal of this genre, this amateur genre is I can imagine myself being in those scenarios with real mm. people having real sex because I'm a real person. My yes. erection doesn't last for three hours. Sometimes yeah. I have prematurely ejaculated. Sometimes I've lost my erection in the middle of having sex with my wife. Mm. But nobody's showing that even in amateur porn. Right. But it is more realistic. It is more of a natural flow of, of how sexuality works for human beings. It's not as much of a production many of the times. Now, there are some blurred lines where that really is not the case. But especially in situations where you've got a couple or an individual, as you talked about, who's set up a camera and they're just stationary filming their sex act. That, that experience of reality is about as close as you're going to get to being, and we haven't even touched on this, a voyeur in the room, absorbing some of that energy, some of that love and connection, right? So th th those are the two psychological dynamics in terms of what is really going on with this category that I think have to be addressed, which is voyeurism mm -hmm. and exhibitionism right? Mm -hmm. What is mm -hmm. voyeurism? Voyeurism is I get sexually aroused and gratified by watching others have sex. All yep. porn is voyeuristic. That's right. Every is. time you masturbate to porn, you are training your body and your mind to be a voyeur. Yeah. To be a third party participant, not a first party participant in sex. So yep. um, Andrew Huberman has talked about this. Jordan Peterson has talked about this, but that's what porn does is it trains you not to be a live participant in sex, but to, to have sex with yourself while you're watching other people have sex. Yes. But when I take it to the next step, which is I want to display my body, I want to show myself having sex mm. with me and my spouse or my partner, whatever. Now I've gone to the degree of I am so desperate to be looked at, to be received with delight mm -hmm. that I'm willing to put it all out there. Yes. And when those two things come together, you're not getting more connection. Mm -mm. You're getting more fake connection, which leaves you feeling more empty on both sides of oh. that equation. You're getting more shame. That's what you're getting. You're getting more a greater shame. experience of shame. And we already have enough shame around our bodies and our sexualities mm -hmm. to go around. What happens is we end up acting out that shame in these forms of pornography. Yeah. And what makes porn and compulsive sexual behavior and sex addiction so powerful is that compounded and compressed shame that has come year after year. It started for us when we were kids in whatever dynamic that we grew up in. And I, I had it and Scott, you had it. And, and I would argue that almost every person on the face of the earth has it in some way, but, when it gets compressed and unseen, the silence around what we really struggled with, we took it to a place where we could find a reflection of the shame because they're doing things that are shameful on screen. I mean, there's a reason why it's, it's not legal to have sex in public because it's not something that will ultimately connect human humanity together. It's never been an approved practice in the history of human culture. 
you you do not show nudity and sexuality. You can be nude in public, which is a different thing, but sexuality in public because it brings about this inner experience of shame. That's how we're we're wired. I'm sorry, we can't get around that. But we move into this stacking and stacking and stacking and stacking and stacking of shame. And you know this as well as I. When I when I work with guys who are in this space, the problem is not their behavior. The problem is they've stacked the shame for decades sometimes. And it takes weeks, months, and years of kindness, of curiosity, of of having um, a gentle perspective on what's going on in here for me to be able, for you to be able to let some of that shame go and begin to see the pain in the faces of the women who are performing in porn, the, the, the loneliness of the men. I mean, I'm convinced that the reason a lot of guys struggle to keep erections d as porn performers is because they know they're literally a stud on a stud farm and it, they mean nothing. Yeah. Um, to put a finer point on it, when you're looking at, you know, professionally produced porn, you're looking at real brokenness in staged display. Yeah. When you're looking at homemade amateur porn, you're looking at real brokenness and pretty close to real life display. Mm. But that dynamic of taking a camera and putting it out there changes the valence of the relational connection even if it seems real. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not talking about if, if you want to make your own homemade video for you and your wife to enjoy. And I'm talking, talking about, about putting it out there for everyone to see it and become... in, in public. Yeah. And, and what, what are you saying about yourself? You're saying yeah. there is, there's such an inadequacy in my own sense of myself that I need other people to see me have sex, I need them to see me at kind of my rawest, my most vulnerable, my most real point in my mm. life. Mm. And I need them to affirm me because that's how deep the brokenness goes in me. And on the flip side, when I want to watch that, I need to take some of that from them because I feel so empty and broken and loveless in my own life. And the only way I'm going to be aroused and connected is to see someone else in their brokenness, put their stuff out there so that I can take from it and become, um, falsely, uh, sexual because w as hard as this is to say, sex is not about orgasm. Sex is about connection. We have been lied to for generations to believe that sex is about orgasm. It's not. Orgasm is the icing on the cake of the, of the connection, which is the human experience that we all long for. The word sex itself comes from Latin sicare. It means to be severed. So yes. the act of sex is to put back together the sense in which I feel disconnected from another. Yep. yep. Right. And, and, and that's, I think for us, Scott, I think, you know, we like you said at the beginning, we could literally take this in a hundred different directions. And so we want to put a pin in it for today and um, just invite you guys that if this is a space where you struggle uh, to ask yourself this question, what, what am I really looking for when I'm turning on the computer and when I'm putting in these words that arouse me, what, what are you really looking for? And stop for a minute to give yourself some grace and say, I don't need to be ashamed in asking that question. I need to be curious to go, where did it come from? How can I be kind to myself and understand that what I want sexually is actually a cry for help in my soul for true connection? Right. And so that th this approach of being curious and kind and just be just be open with yourself about why does this turn me on so much? Like, mm -hmm. what is really going on here? What am I? It's not just about I'm horny and I have to have an orgasm or I can't get rid of this erection. So I just got to do this. It's about why this? Why this particular genre? What is mm -hmm. it about this? What is it doing for me? And don't mm -hmm. say it's not doing anything for me. It is. It's doing something for you or you wouldn't keep doing it. So how does it make you come alive? What are the thoughts that you're saying to yourself as you're viewing those images 
what's it tapping into that's deep in you? Mm. And how come you have to go to this to get it? Why can't you just get it in your normal life? If you'll trace those stories back, it's going to start to unravel some things that haven't made sense in your life. And it's going to start pointing you in a direction where you can actually maybe think about dealing with the issues that are driving the problem or the pornography is the symptom. It's your solution. It's not really your problem. But what's the problem? It's by that approach of being curious about what is this doing for me? How is it helping me? Going back to being honest about that and not judging yourself um, and just going to the, well, I'm just aroused. I'm just horny. No, be curious. Yeah, absolutely. So we want to keep engaging uh, with you. Check out uh, future episodes coming your way. Uh, we're also on uh, TikTok. So if you want to catch some clips at wegotballs.pod um, on TikTok, you can watch those there. Share them with your friends. Love to invite more people into the conversation. And uh, it's always great to be with you. So this is just reminding you guys to approach your sexual arousal with curious and kindness, just like we do on We Got Balls. And so do you. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget to subscribe for more episodes you can connect with chris at pornfreemasculinity.com and with scott at successfulmen.com